We all live in the digital world. We all need it to be open and safe. We all want to trust. And to be trusted. We all despise control. And desire freedom. We, we are all united. united. Hello? Do people hear me? <laughs> Just a little... Yeah, okay. Yes. Um, I'm not hearing you. Hello, everybody. Hi. If you can hear, you can hear me? Great, great. Yes, I can hear you. Yes. yes, good to have you, finally. Uh, the music kind of stopped. <laughs> Did we lose the uh, moderator? Okay. <laughs> Do you hear me? Yeah, everything fine? There was a breakup just now. Okay, if there is anything, just let me know, huh? because, um, yeah, uh, the connection could uh, disrupt any time. But uh, hopefully, we're all good people, so we should all be fine. And, uh, yeah, let me kindly ask all my panelists to switch their camera on so that we know who are there and... Uh, if everybody is there, I know two of our panelists would join us momentarily. So uh, we should have uh, five people on with video and I am, okay, great. I see two guests on site, great. So that's, uh, that's the right number of people. So without much ado, um, let me get things going. And a warm welcome and hello from middle of the night here in Beijing. I'm Vishin from CGTN. It's a great honor to be able to host this uh, high-level leaders track on building equitable employment conditions and competences for the future of work as part of the 16th annual Internet Governance Forum that is being held in a hybrid manner from uh, Katowice, Poland. I hope I say the name correctly. I would have loved to be there, but uh, unfortunately, something is preventing us. But thank God we have good technology, and that is also part of our discussion today. So the future of work is facing changes, including a shift in demand towards ICT professionals, a move to independent, flexible, and freelance employment, a need for keeping pace with technological evolutions and a transfer of human capacities to more reflective, creative and complex tasks. A case in point for me as a TV presenter is the onslaught of AI presenters whose makeup is always perfect and never make mistakes. But how will these new technologies impact labor markets and income distribution? We don't know fully yet. What we know is that the right policy, policy mix and institutional arrangements can and are needed to help employers and potential employees to adapt and thrive. And that's an important discussion to be had. That's why we're hosting this high-level leaders track on how governments and international organizations and private sector can further and better collaborate to help adopt and diffuse new technologies while addressing their negative consequences. Our discussion will focus on policy alternatives from educational ones addressing early education, including STEM focus and constant reskilling for future employment, to ones dealing with new forms of balancing in employment relationships. The panel will reflect on policies that can help employees and society at large to manage the transition with as little disruption and as many benefits as possible. And I hope our discussion today will have as little disruption and as much usefulness as possible for all of you who are watching us either online or offline on site. Let me introduce with great pleasure the distinguished panelists we are going to have, or we already have with us. Uh, we will welcome Ms. Carmen Lejia Valderrama. She is Minister of Information Technologies and Communications from Colombia. She will join us momentarily. We, will ha we have, and I'm going to try here, Mr. Wojciech Merzik, 
Secretary of State, Ministry of Science and Education from Poland, our host country. Please correct me if I <laughs> pronounce the name not so accurately. We have, uh, we will have Mr. Thorsten Schäfer Gumbel, who is member of the management board of the Agency for International Cooperation, or GIZ, from Germany. He will join us momentarily as well. But we do have Ms. Ranalia Abdul Rahim, Senior Vice President of Strategy, Communications and Engagement of Internet Society. She's joining us online. We have Mr. Luke McKend, Head of Growth Markets and Head of Government Sector of uh, EMEA LATAM from LinkedIn. We have uh, Mr. John Van Vakaitis, who is Director of Google for Education International, joining us online. And we also have on site Mr. Benga Sezan, Executive Director of Paradigm Initiative. So the warmest welcome to all of you. I'm not hearing any applause. I suppose people are applauding, but <laughs> that's fine. We are going to imagine as we go ahead. But uh, with such a distinguished panel and a very mixed perspective and from different part of the world, I'm really looking forward to the conversation. So let's go right ahead and uh, start with uh, the structured discussion. We're going to have three main topics and I'm, I mean, and I'm going to ask my panelists to give their thoughts and perspectives under these uh, three different perspectives. Um, each of our panelists will have three minutes maximum to make their interventions and uh, we we'll want to hear as much as possible. And finally, we'll have uh, some concluding remarks if people feel the need to do so. So let's go ahead. And uh, I'm going to ask the first question, which is uh, about policies, because a major current topic of discussion is the need for policies that target early education, including STEM-focused education, to prepare our young people for the future of work and new technologies. So I want to ask all of you coming from public and private sectors and international organizations, how do you think this global need can be addressed? And uh, if I may have the honor to ask our host, our guest from our host country, Poland, Mr. Uh, Murzek, the Secretary of State of the Ministry of Science and Education to please go ahead. Thank you, sir. Szanowni Państwo, zdajemy sobie sprawę z dynamiki zmian, które zachodzą. Ta dynamika jeszcze uległa większemu przyspieszeniu ze względu na ten trudny czas pandemii, gdzie zdaliśmy sobie sprawę z takich obszarów, które są obszarami niezwykle wrażliwymi i nie tylko chodzi o te obszary związane ze zdrowiem, ale też z gospodarką, która w konsekwencji pandemii w wielu punktach świata uległa mocnemu zawirowaniu. I też myślę, że w świadomości wszystkich jest zauważanie tej pewnej sprzeczności, czyli z jednej strony wiele lat całego procesu edukacji, żeby przygotować nasze dzieci, później młodzież, studentów i młodych pracowników do tego, co się dzieje na rynku pracy, a z drugiej strony dynamika zmian, która pokazuje, że rzeczywiście trzeba odpowiadać na rzeczywistość taką, jaka jest wokół nas, na te wyzwania i te wymogi, które czasami skokowo się zmieniają. I pierwszym wyzwaniem to jest też jakby takie wyzwanie pewnie ogólnoświatowe, żeby tworzyć mechanizmy pewnego wyprzedzającego przewidywania rozwoju istotnych kierunków dla cywilizacji, dla rozwoju państw, dla wzmacniania poszczególnych gospodarek, 
ale też w tej przestrzeni zmian kulturowych, żeby edukacja była ten krok przed wszystkimi zmianami. To jest niezwykle ważna sztuka i myślę, że w wymiarze międzynarodowym należy wspierać te instytucje, te dobre praktyki, które pozwalają najlepiej tym wyzwaniom sprostać. Zdajemy sobie sprawę, że pewne rzeczy zaczynają się już na bardzo wczesnym etapie. Stąd na przykład w Polsce, patrząc na ten plan odbudowy po pandemii, na przykład mamy wpisany trwały element cyfryzacji, ale już nie tylko w szkołach, ale zaczynając od wzmocnienia cyfrowej edukacji poprzez różne formy zabawy, ale na poziomie nawet przedszkoli, nie tylko pierwszych klas szkolnych. Później oczywiście ten proces jest dalej ważny, żeby go pilotować już na poziomie szkół i tam rozmawiamy, jak nie tylko wesprzeć poprzez sprzęt, poprzez dobrze przygotowane programy nauczania, ale też robić to, biorąc pod uwagę grupę wiekową w sposób atrakcyjny, czyli żeby poprzez zabawę na przykład dzieci uczyły się programować roboty, które są potrzebne w przemyśle zwanym przemysłem 4.0, czasami 5.0. I to musimy robić już dzisiaj, wiedząc, że to są wyzwania cywilizacyjne. Jednocześnie oprócz tej świadomości i szukania tych obszarów wyzwań i uczenia szczególnie w tych obszarach nowych wyzwań, Musimy dostosowywać te programy, ale jednocześnie cała infrastruktura powinna temu sprzyjać, czyli już powinniśmy zauważać potrzebę, żeby w programach znalazły się opisy zjawisk wykorzystujących technologię wodorową przykładowo, sztuczną inteligencję, wyjaśniając w przystępny sposób, co to oznacza ale też zauważając, że młodzież jest wciągana przez ten świat wirtualny, też pokazywać, że to, co robimy, tego, czego się uczymy, musi mieć przełożenie na ten wymiar świata realnego, czyli jeżeli na przykład myślimy o przemyśle 4.0 i o robotach, to nie tylko o ich programowaniu czy, czy aspekcie takim wizualnym, ale zdając sobie sprawę, że trzeba wziąć do ręki jakieś narzędzie, że trzeba przykręcić jakąś śrubkę, czyli wejść w tą przestrzeń właśnie takiego realizmu. I te pewne tendencje przyzwyczajenia kształtują się czasami we wczesnych latach, później mogą być rozwijane, wzmacniane. I tutaj wielkim wyzwaniem jest tworzenie też kompetentnych pracowników, którzy zajmują się całym systemem doradztwa, którzy są w stanie rzeczywiście oceniać zdolności, predyspozycje dzieci, później młodzieży, patrzeć jakie wyzwania są na rynku pracy, jakie kompetencje będą tymi kompetencjami, których dzisiaj nie jesteśmy w stanie precyzyjnie nazwać, ale to znaczy, że to są kompetencje przyszłości i przygotowywać właśnie zgodnie z zainteresowaniami, zgodnie z predyspozycjami dzieci, młodzież do takich wyborów, które będą trafione, bo nie chodzi tylko o jakiekolwiek miejsca pracy, o jakiekolwiek odnalezienie się na rynku pracy, ale też o takie zawody, taką pracę, która spowoduje przyspieszony rozwój naszych społeczności, ale jednocześnie będzie źródłem takiej zwykłej satysfakcji, poczucia, że się robi rzeczy bardzo znaczące, pożyteczne społecznie. I też myślę, że sporym wyzwaniem cywilizacyjnym 
jest postrzeganie pewnych rozwiązań w sposób taki interdyscyplinarny, żeby też umieć pracować w zespołach ludzkich, widzieć kontekst tej pracy szerszy społecznie, gospodarczo, cywilizacyjnie i rzeczywiście potrafić współdzielić te umiejętności. To, czego się na tym etapie nauczymy, a za to bierzemy jako państwa odpowiedzialność, powinno też w taki dobry sposób przekładać się na umiejętności współpracy w wymiarze międzynarodowym, żeby też uczyć się, że zmiany są tak istotne, wyzwania są tak duże, że trzeba pracować później w zespołach międzynarodowych i tych związanych z nauką, ale też tych związanych z gospodarką. Globalizacja wielu zjawisk sprawia, że mamy wiele wyzwań podobnych i choćby patrzenie na zrównoważony rozwój, na wyzwania energetyczne, klimatyzacyjne, to pokazuje, że, że musimy w krajach też myśleć w niektórych kategoriach w sposób podobny i tworzyć, tworzyć takie procesy kształcenia, żeby jak najlepiej przygotowywać właśnie do sprostania tym wyzwaniom, ale też poprzez elementy współpracy. Oczywiście środki zaangażowane przez poszczególne państwa, technologia, która powinna, szczególnie nauczyliśmy się wielu rzeczy w tym czasie pandemii, technologia, która cały proces edukacji powinna wspierać, to są rzeczy, które stają jako wyzwania przed nami, ale też myślę, że tutaj współdzielenie dobrych praktyk, wymiana informacji jest niezwykle ważna. Też niezwykle istotnym elementem jest tworzenie elementów właśnie otwartości nauki, otwartości tych procesów i co do zawartości, i co do metod i zaangażowanych środków, zaangażowanych technologii, żeby rzeczywiście postrzegać coraz więcej wątków jako wspólne wyzwania w wymiarze międzynarodowym, bo wtedy uzyskujemy te efekty synergii, wtedy szeroko rozumiana wymiana społeczna, wymiana osób jest czymś, co będzie dawało nie tylko satysfakcję, ale będzie przybliżało nas do dobrych efektów. I to są takie akcenty, o których, o których warto rozmawiać, tak jak zdajemy sobie sprawę, że również dla wielu krajów wielkim wyzwaniem jest budowanie silnej pozycji nie tylko dla edukacji, nie tylko dla dydaktyki, ale też pozycji dla nauki, bo zdajemy sobie sprawę, że bez osiągnięć nauki choćby ta konfrontacja z pandemią sprawiłaby, że nie moglibyśmy rozmawiać o szczepionkach, jeżeli badania poprzedzające pewne metody nie trwałyby od wielu, wielu lat. Później przyspieszenie i szukanie intensywnie rozwiązań ma swoją mocną bazę. I tutaj przykład też takiego globalnego spojrzenia na te wyzwania. Myślę, że jest takim dobrym doświadczeniem, że w trudnej sytuacji, w sytuacji też takiego światowego kryzysu, myślę, że ten świat nauki szuka i znajduje odpowiedzi. Tych wyzwań, jak powiedziałem, jest istotnych co najmniej kilka i choćby taka przestrzeń jak właśnie takie międzynarodowe też fora, kongresy, gdzie możemy się dzielić dobrymi praktykami, gdzie możemy się dzielić doświadczeniem albo stawiać sobie wspólne cele, to jest też takie przedsięwzięcie niezwykle dla nas wszystkich ważne. Mam nadzieję, że 
tego typu spotkania jak to w Katowicach, ale też w wymiarze jak widać i słychać globalnym, łącząc się z całym światem, sprawią, że rzeczywiście będzie to taki impuls ożywczy dla nas wszystkich, żeby przeglądnąć to wszystko, czym dysponujemy, tą ofertę poszczególnych państw i właśnie wspierać się, dzielić się dobrymi praktykami, osiągnięciami nauki, bo bez tego rzeczywiście dochodzenie do jakiejś równowagi, do jakichś dobrych rozwiązań może zbyt długo trwać, a dynamika tych wszystkich zmian jest wielkim, wielkim wyzwaniem również podołania temu w czasie. A ta lista jest rzeczywiście bardzo długa. Dlatego też wspieramy wszelkie programy, już zaczynając, tak jak wspomniałem, od przedszkola poprzez różne formy dotyczące szkół podstawowych, średnich, poprzez wspieranie młodych naukowców, studentów, doktorantów. Lista programów rządowych byłaby bardzo długa, to nie chciałbym tutaj jej prezentować, ale szukamy też w tym wszystkim takiego efektu, synergii, żeby te wszystkie rozwiązania sprawiały ciągłość w patrzeniu na proces edukacji i były takim naturalnym następstwem albo dawały right. poczucie efektu synergii. Myślę, że, że tyle takiej startowej wypowiedzi z zainteresowaniem będę też słuchał kolejnych głosów. Dziękuję bardzo. Thank you so much, uh, Minister Mertzek, for that very comprehensive uh, uh, answer to the first question. And uh, I have noted uh, a, a few key words such as targeted early, continuous, uh, digital infrastructure, interdisciplinary, international and open of course. Thank you so much for that great start to the discussion. I would love to introduce the other two guests who have joined us uh, just now. They are Ms. Carmen Ligia Valderrama, who is Minister of Information Technologies and Communications from Colombia. Welcome to the discussion. We have also been joined by Mr. Torsten schaefer Gumbel, who is member of the Management Board of the Agency for International Cooperation, or GIZ from Germany, so they are, they are both joining us online. Without much ado, let me hand over to um, Minister Vaderama for her intervention. Uh, what is being done in Colombia to prepare children uh, from an early age on for the changing dynamics in education? Three minutes, please. Madam, please unmute your microphone, yes. Please, yeah, unmute your microphone. You still muted? We don't hear you yet. Yes, right now, right now. Please go ahead. Um, está encendido. Yes. Escucha? Ya me están now, escuchando en este momento? Now we hear you. Yes. Okay, muy bien. Eh, lo primero sea saludarles muy especialmente. Eh, permíteme decirles que me siento muy honrada de poder participar en este panel sobre este tema tan relevante para todas las naciones. Hoy creo que no hay nación en el planeta Tierra que no esté interesado y dándole toda la prioridad a este asunto, a enfrentar pues desde la política pública los grandes retos de la transformación digital para ponerla al servicio de la gente es nuestra prioridad. De esta manera, pues quisiera compartirles cuál ha sido y cuál está siendo y cuál va a ser la experiencia en Colombia sobre el particular. Eh, tenemos claro que como Estado debemos eh, ser aliados en la formación de los jóvenes en todas las disciplinas que tienen que ver eh, con el STEM, en ciencia, tecnología, ingeniería y matemáticas principalmente. Y es por ello que eh, el gobierno nacional colombiano a través prácticamente de nuestro ministerio, el Ministerio de Tecnologías de la Información y las Comunicaciones, 
eh, ha liderado, no por ello solo, por el contrario, conjuntamente, transversalmente con muchos ministerios, por no decir todos, eh, adoptando varias políticas y estrategias para impulsar la transformación digital a través de diferentes proyectos con el fin de cerrar esa brecha digital eh, que no solo en conectividad tenemos, sino desde el uso y la apropiación de la tecnología. Y creo que eso es un primer punto, una primera experiencia a resaltar, y es que nosotros eh, como Ministerio de las TIC venimos liderando, pero es, se ha evidenciado cómo ese trabajo tiene que ser completamente transversal a todos los sectores. Aquí no podemos dejar de lado el sector de la educación, el sector salud, el sector eh, agrícola inclusive, y todos eh, están involucrados en, en estas políticas. Dicho esto, la estrategia trazada conforme a nuestra política pública viene adelantando diferentes programas en pro de esa transformación digital que yo resumiría en dos importantes rutas. La primera, la ruta de formación de talento y una segunda ruta de transformación digital empresarial que necesariamente hemos entendido deben ir de la mano. La primera ruta consistente justamente en la formación de ese talento que se requiere a lo largo de la trayectoria académica es una de nuestras prioridades y eh, hemos venido eh, estimulando para ese efecto el interés en las disciplinas STEM, como lo decía, la ciencia, la tecnología, la ingeniería y las matemáticas, y eso nos ha permitido ir potenciando eh, la vocación científica y tecnológica en niños y niñas. Eh, seguidamente de esta ruta, pues debemos trazar un camino específico y claro para que los estudiantes puedan encontrar durante su formación, como por ejemplo en el bachillerato o secundaria, eh, las oportunidades de seguir creciendo en estas disciplinas. Y en el segundo lugar está la transformación digital empresarial, eh, que hemos venido diseñando eh, programas para transformar a las empresas en materia digital desde el diagnóstico del estado digital hasta promover la adopción e incorporación de tecnologías como analítica de datos, inteligencia artificial, machine learning, blockchain, para mejorar pues, la cadena de valor. Y esto nos permite que el conocimiento del mercado y la comercialización de productos, de bienes y de servicios del sector sea mejor. Aquí eh, una cosa muy importante y es que nosotros tenemos claro que eh, la educación para el efecto debe ir de la mano de la implementación de ese conocimiento y por eso es que estamos trabajando conjuntamente la línea de formación en los jóvenes e inclusive en adultos, en niños, jóvenes e inclusive en adultos y eh, la empleabilidad que hay de ese conocimiento, poderlo aplicar, que se pueda apropiar en, toda la, en todo el sector empresarial, sean pequeñas o medianas empresas e inclusive grandes empresas. Hay una necesidad sentida, eh, sé que no solamente en Colombia, sino en el mundo entero, mmm, en materia de conocimiento de estas personas que tienen perfiles técnicos que puedan apoyar desde la programación y desde estos frentes eh, a todos los sectores de la economía. Por ello es que nos hemos enfocado no solamente en educar, en generar el conocimiento respecto de estas materias, sino también responder desde el sector empresarial eh, a la necesidad que el sector empresarial nos está solicitando y a la necesidad de emplearse de quienes se están capacitando. De manera que aquí estaríamos respondiendo a una política muy clara de fortalecimiento de nuestro talento humano, pero también de la implementación de ese talento humano en beneficio de todos los sectores eh, del país. Eh, sin distinción, como les digo, aquí hay conocimiento, en materia, tenemos experiencias, por ejemplo, en el sector agrícola bellísimas, donde eh, educar a estos jóvenes para implementar la tecnología, para desarrollar el sector el sector agrícola está siendo muy exitoso y eso pues nos permite eh, constatar que el camino que estamos tomando es el indicado. Tenemos claro que es necesario seguir impulsando políticas de transformación digital orientadas a la empresa y que el Estado, con el propósito eh, de esa demanda de talento que se requiere, pues debemos seguir trabajando, aumentando todas esas capacidades y eh, ampliando las oportunidades de empleo para todos nuestros jóvenes. Thank you, Madame, for that uh, very brief but uh, very focused 
intervention. I understand that Colombia see the great need in the transformation of education towards the digital era, and you emphasize very much the role of enterprises, both in providing the education and in helping training young talents. And this education is extremely well defined according to the need of the labor market. Thank you so much for that uh, Colombian perspective. Next, let's hear from some international organizations. What do they think can be done? to meet the need, the global need for young talents for the digital age. Let me go to Ms. Ranalia Abdul Rahim, Senior Vice President of Strategy, Communications and Engagement from Internet Society. Please, Ms. Rahim, your team. Thank you, Ms. Liu. It is a pleasure and a privilege to be here today. So here's my view on the question that you posed. It would be in the best interest of every country to have national policies that target early education, to prepare young people for the future of work and new technologies. What's important is to ensure that the policies are inclusive, that they foster access to learning resources for disadvantaged groups, such as those living in rural areas or in poverty, ethnic minorities, speakers of minority languages, and those with disabilities. This includes having effective mechanisms for addressing gender inequalities in education and for improving opportunities and outcomes for girls, particularly in STEM education. But education policies alone won't be sufficient. They need supportive access and connectivity policies in place to be effective. Over the years, the internet has proven to be instrumental for learning and development of people and nations the COVID-19 pandemic has shown us just how much we depend on the internet and its resilience, an attribute of its distributed governance model. The lesson of the pandemic as people are forced to stay at home is plain and clear. No internet means no access to remote education, work or health services. Socioeconomic growth and potential for many countries have been damaged. As we move towards a future that is more technologically driven, with emphasis on blended learning, the world's internet and digital dependency will only increase. But benefits accrue mainly to those that are connected. This inequality is the challenge that societies around the world are grappling with today. We all know that nearly half the world's population are still offline. The majority of them are women and most in developing countries. If they are left unconnected, what is the future of education and work for them and their children? Universal access is needed to unlock the internet's value for supporting education and national development of the future. To get to universal access, access to the internet needs to be affordable for people. Access to broadband internet in particular is key if benefits for education and development are to be reaped. Here are five things that are needed to enable access based on lessons learned from countries around the world. First, a governmental commitment to keeping the internet on and not to shut it down. Internet shutdowns are costly with adverse social and economic effects. Second, a legal and regulatory framework that stimulates investment in connectivity that spurs competition and lowers access prices. Third, flexible and innovative funding approaches. And this includes effective deployment of universal access funds and service programs. Fourth, national broadband strategies and universal access programs that include the participation of educational institutions and national research and education networks. And finally, diverse models for access and use, including community-based access initiatives, such as community networks educational networks and local R&D initiatives that generate these diverse models. I conclude by emphasizing that successful approaches to meeting the educational needs of the future require a serious and equal focus on both education and access policies. Thank you, and back to you, Ms. Liu. Thank you so much, Renalia. Uh, exactly. As I was researching for this topic, I was almost shocked to learn that uh, almost half of the world are still digitally offline. That's according to the statistics from the United Nations. And most of that is uh, for women and for 
developing countries. So you have highlighted a very important uh, aspect that need to be addressed. Many thanks to Rania, Ranalia. Next, let's go to Mr. Luke McKent, Head of Growth Markets and Head of Government Sector from uh, EMEA and LATAM regions from LinkedIn. Mr. McKent, please go ahead. Hi, and uh, thank you very much for having me on the panel. Um, it's it, it's hard to argue with anything that any of the uh, panelists have already have already mentioned. I just perhaps want to add a few a few additional comments. I think the the primary question from my perspective would be what kind of future are we actually preparing our, our youth for? Um, if we believe that the only future that we're preparing them for is a technological future, um, I suspect that we're probably missing the trick. Yes, of course, STEM style uh, STEM uh, STEM education is incredibly important. And the ongoing digitalization of our economies is something that you know, will, will be continuing for, for, for decades to come. But there are a couple of other things that we need to take into account that um, I think are incredibly important. One of which is the, the softer skills that will be con continue to be needed to be developed um, in order for us to make full use of all of the digital talent that we have uh, in our economies. And uh, what, 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 what could those look like? Uh, I think we're, we're looking at how do we collaborate effectively? How do we teach collaboration? How do, we teach, how do we teach problem solving? How do we develop the kind of foundational skills that enable uh, the children of today to become the adults of the future that love lifelong learning? Because that is probably the primary skill that all of us are going to have to adopt in order to be consistently relevant throughout our careers. One of the biggest challenges that I think, uh, never mind governments, but any private sector organization has at the moment, is keeping up with the pace of change and the, the changing needs of the skill sets of our employees uh, from a day-to-day -day basis. If I think about when I started my career, uh, a short, uh, maybe 25 years ago, many of the job titles that now exist within the organization that I currently work for did not exist. In fact, many of those job titles didn't exist 10 years ago. So how do we develop educational systems that are flexible and adaptable enough to cope with a labor market that is changing so quickly? That is, that is the primary challenge that we have. And that is why it's, it's very hard to focus on a narrow set of skills that may, way, may well be technological in nature without also focusing on the skills that enable us to adapt and develop over time. So I, I would suggest those are some of the things that we really need to think very carefully about. Um, I also feel very strongly that uh, we, we have a couple of other challenges that are that almost uh, uh, pre-learning, so to speak. And the previous speaker alluded very, very much to those, and, and that is the problem of access. Um, and it's much of the educational challenges that we're talking about are predicated on people's access and, and youth access to the internet. That, that is a fantastic solution to a problem if you're in a mature internet economy. But that's not a great solution to the problem when you're in Africa or when you're anywhere else where internet penetration falls well below the kind of penetration that we see in mature internet economies. And there are huge issues of access relating to the kind of devices that people use, the, the price of internet, infrastructural issues. Uh, and not only that, what is the content that people consume? Is it localized? Is it local language? There are a variety of challenges that we need to address to make sure that everyone globally has equal access to the kind of educational opportunities that we enjoy in mature internet economies. So I would just raise those as a few of the additional challenges that we might face. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. McKent. Absolutely uh, essential questions you have asked. Actually, sometimes I feel the more digitally advanced we are, the more we need to think about the important questions about life, about humanities, right? about sociology. How do our mind work? How do we get peace in this digital age? But uh, thank you so much for raising these questions. I hope we'll have some answers as we move along and you know, as, uh, as we leave this panel. Uh, next, let me go to Mr. John Van Vakaitis, he's Director of Google for Education International. Very much looking forward to your, your intervention on how to meet the global need for early education that prepare our young people for the future of work. 
We don't hear you, sir. So we don't hear you. Hello? Yes, now we hear you. Yes. Sorry. Yeah, I had to mute off. Uh, great points made by the panelists. Thanks for, for uh, introducing me, Lucian. Uh, I think it, uh, I'll make a couple of macro points and then we'll get into some more detail and hopefully everyone can still hear me. Am I being heard? Because I hear you holding your mic. Give me a thumbs up if you can hear me. Okay, great. Uh, at Google, we've been focused on supporting and enriching education with digital tools and the past couple of years have only served uh, to reinforce the importance of this, right? And I wanted to highlight three macro level points that I think are, are probably very obvious for everybody but worth repeating and then get into some detailed thoughts around STEM and, and around higher policy or greater policy. Um, one is the way we work has changed. It's very clear. You can see how we're participating today, right? Millions around the world have turned their homes into virtual offices uh, due to the pandemic and technology is essential to stay connected uh, with our day-to-day -day work. And this is the same in education as well, right? And it's impacted not only labor, but education. It needs to impact an education policy and labor policy. Um, and as we've seen over the past two years, uh, it, it, was, it was a growing trend, but it's really obviously accelerated is the use of education technology has really skyrocketed in schools. Schools have been searching for solutions to keep students engaged and learning. And as most students return uh, to classrooms and others continue to learn from home because we have different situations in different countries, we continue to be very optimistic about the positive role that education technology will play in helping teachers and school leaders in the years ahead. And ultimately the goal of, of technology and education is to augment and amplify the critical work undertaken by educators. And I think that's the most important thing. Technology is a tool for us, it's not a panacea. I think digital skills clearly are increasingly needed in the ever evolving employment landscape. Um, we're not able to predict, I think uh, some of the points made, and I think Luke mentioned this as well, as, as well as Renali is, and you mentioned it yourself in your, in your opening, is flexibility. You mentioned the term flexibility, and I think we have to maintain flexibility. We don't know what the answers are going to be. We don't know what new professions are going to arise in the coming years. We have to prepare children by teaching them how to use digital tools and develop deeper literacies and understanding of those tools. That's one component, right? But they also obviously need to have a flexible approach to learning and a desire to learn. It's very, very important. We have to make learning inclusive and exciting and inter interactive. It's very, very important to do this, how you keep people engaged. And this is not just for STEM. It's essential in many, many other areas, right? Um, again, technology is a tool. It's a tool just like we're using pen, paper, and books, right? It's just the next generation of, of tools for us. Uh, it's very, very important. I think one of the other speakers talked about government level policies and programs that support clear mechanisms to nurture transformation at all levels. So you need to have access to the internet. You need to have an open approach to using technology in the classroom. This is gonna form the basis for employment, right? It's very, very important for us. I think STEM is an important part of this. STEM is not the whole piece of it, but let's be honest, there are a, a great movement in job employment opportunities into STEM-based roles. And so any, any government would wanna consider what's their position in building skills in this area to prepare uh, students to be the next level of employed uh, adults in the workforce and, and what they're needed. There was a report just released by the Brookings Institute entitled Building Skills for Life. It's a, it's a, a report that we co-sponsored uh, talking about how to expand and improve computer science education around the world. And I think it's a, it's a great tool for me to take a look at and to read. Um, it provides case studies of larger scale implementations of computer science informal education as well. But I would say that beyond STEM, there are some fundamental elements that are really strong indicator success in education. Again, I'm approaching this from an education perspective. One is the public entity has to be willing and able to invest in the necessary infrastructure to make computing education possible. And I think one of our other speakers touched on this. Um, the entity has, uh, has to be engaged in partnerships with stakeholders including teacher groups, parents, and industry. And it has to be focused on upskilling current teachers. And this is really important, upskilling current teachers and creating a healthy pipeline of future teachers. So working with teacher colleges as well, who can address uh, the needs, the coming needs, right? So the use of technology is not going to slow and it poses a learning curve uh, for all of us and, and an opportunity as well. So it's for students, it's for teachers, it's for all of us working, right? Uh, we have worked very, very hard on, um, on creating certification programs for teachers as well in the use of technology 
in their classroom. So a large component of our efforts in global education have been devoted to helping teachers develop comfort and competency using technology in the classroom to support their learning plans. It's a very, very important element. That investment in teachers needs to be a policy initiative in all governments. And it's one that certainly we've been supporting through a lot of our investments and in our efforts in education. And I'll leave it at that. Thank you so much. Thank you very much, John. Again, a very different perspective from the use of educational technologies and flexibility not just in the content of uh, what is being taught, but also in the approach of how these are being taught. And last but definitely not least, what are we going to do with the, the teachers? How do we upskill the teachers who will be teaching the young talents? Again, very essential questions there. Many thanks to John again. And uh, still on the same important question, let me go to Executive Director of Paradigm Initiative, Mr. Banga Cezanne who is joining us on site. I understand this is a grouping for uh, helping underprivileged youth in Africa where digital access is not particularly strong. So, sir, help us understand your perspective on the question. Thank you. You know, if COVID has so far taught us anything, it's the fact that there are two kinds of young people. Uh, there's, on one hand, the young person who is taking advantage of technology opportunities. Now they are learning more things than they used to learn in the classroom physically. Uh, but they're also picking up skills uh, around independence and other soft skills. And on the other hand, this is a second category of young people who not only are not learning, but are also forgetting the things that they learned. When schools were closed uh, in March 2020, uh, what we found at the Paradigm Initiative was that there, were, there was a whole group of young people who not only forgot what they had learned, but were literally getting into a second level of digital divide. So we already had a digital divide where about 40% of the world is not connected. Now we have a second level divide where not only are they unconnected or disconnected, but they're also almost in a whole different world entirely where they don't have access to, you know, to information and to learning. And I think this is why you know, any form of policies that we would discuss must take two things you know, uh, into consideration. First is the reality of the current moment. It's very you know, great to think of tech uh, when we're considering policies. And I've seen many government policies across many countries where we work, uh, where their policies are completely disconnected from their realities, uh, where governments talk about learning online, uh, but the students absolutely have no access to computers. We had a scenario in one of the countries where the government then said before you, you know, you have to write your exit examination from secondary school online. It has to be a computer-based test, but by the final year, almost all of the students had not even seen a computer. So a few weeks before the exams, they had to go to a public cafe. They had to go to public cafes to go and learn how to use a computer for the first time and then to write exams using computers in a few weeks. So we have that challenge of the unconnected 40% that we must consider when we're developing policies. The second is that while it's very convenient to try to do what everyone else does in terms of you know, fourth industrial revolution, STEM, and all of that, policies must be grounded in the reality of national socioeconomic plans. And I say this because in many scenarios, universities across many of the countries that we work produce graduates who literally are not fit to work in the countries. Uh, so many of them end up picking up skills that only make them relevant when they emigrate, when they leave the countries. We need a handshake between industry in that specific country and the academia. What are the needs? You know, I had a chance to ask you know, one of the government institutions in, in Nigeria this question last week. What skills? does Nigeria need in the next 10 years? Now, those skills should then determine what the curriculum should be in universities. We can't disconnect industry need on the ground from you know, uh, the curriculum. And, and the last thing I'd, I'd like to say is that many of the solutions to the problem we have exist in many civil society and even private sector projects. And I think it's high time that many governments you know, took advantage of these projects as scaling opportunities. See those projects that have been done across the global south as an opportunity 
you know, as a test of many of the solutions we're looking for, and then we can, you know, we can then scale those solutions. Many of those projects, you know, that are done by private initiative and others uh, are able to reach just a few millions. But imagine if policy is able to shake hands with many of the sample projects that have delivered results, we can then see that scale uh, on a very, very large scale. And I'll pause here for now. Thank you so much, Mr. Cezanne. Uh, I think uh, you have highlighted once again the, the reality that COVID-19 has brought the digital divide front and central to us. Uh, almost wherever we are, actually, this problem is not just in Africa, in the underdeveloped South, even in developed countries. I tell you, in Switzerland, for instance, when everybody was caught up in the pandemic, even the teachers were complaining about not having the computer to work on, you know, to, to help the children learn and, and submit home, home uh, assignments and stuff. So this is really a, a global problem. And in a way, COVID-19 uh, shook us to the, the grim reality. But uh, great perspectives you have mentioned, absolutely essential there as well. So we have come to... The, um, the, 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 the end of the first question in our structured um, discussion, and we're going to move on to actually one step further to how to facilitate exactly, and this is one of the things that we, many of the speakers have talked about, how, how governments um, adopt an approach that facilitates the adoption and use of new technologies in general. So not just for students, not just for teachers, but for all members of society. How can we ensure that all citizens acquire the necessary skills to face new technological developments? Let's not forget the elderly population, for instance, the disadvantaged in an aging society such as China, for instance, this is a great challenge. And uh, without much ado, let me give the floor to Ms. Carmen Lehia Varaderama once again for her intervention. Madam, the mic is yours, please. Muy bien, muchas gracias. Um, yo quiero decirles que coincido con eh, mis antecesores eh, y voy a conectar sus intervenciones con la pregunta que acaban de decir. Yo creo que aquí no podemos obviar, por lo menos desde Colombia, en nuestras condiciones, los tres grandes derroteros que debemos de tener presente. No solamente trabajar en la conectividad, en lograr que se llegue con la conexión a todo el territorio nacional, sino que debemos de generar la implementación de esas herramientas que les permitan usar esa conectividad a todo nivel. Estamos de acuerdo, inclusive en personas adultas y adultas mayores que hoy por hoy también han necesitado ya eh, aprender de las nuevas tecnologías. Y por supuesto, el tercer eh, derrotero que estamos trabajando aquí en Colombia es el de la apropiación, en que realmente la tecnología se convierta no solamente en, en un instrumento que les facilite la vida cotidiana a los colombianos, sino que les permita desarrollar y potencializar mucho más cada una de sus actividades. Y en este punto entonces quiero eh, compartirles cómo las políticas públicas de, de esa apropiación digital que tenemos en Colombia están diseñadas entendiendo todas esas necesidades específicas de cada una de las poblaciones a las que queremos impactar. De hecho, tenemos eh, muchos eh, proyectos que van dirigidos dependiendo el foco social en el que, con el que estamos trabajando. Mujeres, niños, jóvenes, emprendedores, inclusive hay un proyecto que yo resalto muy especialmente que es el de trabajo con mujeres no escolarizadas de entrada pareciera un poco exótico porque pensar en enseñar tecnología a quienes no tienen un nivel de escolaridad parece contradictorio, pero lo cierto es que la tecnología se ha vuelto en un lenguaje, en un lenguaje que al contrario lo que hace es conectar la realidad con la posibilidad de desarrollar sobre todo sus emprendimientos Ok, madame Okay, Madam Minister, I'm so sorry to, yeah, I'm so sorry to interrupt. I have just been told I have three minutes left, so I do want to, but we got the gist of your intervention. I, and I do have one more question. So I'm going to go straight to the last question. Uh, how would you define equitable employment conditions and where do you see major leverages for change? Uh, if I may, uh, let me give the, the opportunity to Mr. Torten Schäfer Gumbel from GIZ Germany. If you could, in two minutes, please, sum up your answer, sir. 
<laughs> I'm so sorry about this. Yeah, time is really limited. I was told five minutes left. Herzlichen Dank für die Einladung. Auf der einen Seite bietet digitale Arbeit neue und flexible Beschäftigungsformen. Das digitale Outsourcing und Offshoring kann in erheblichen Umfang Arbeitsplätze schaffen und auch im Bereich des digitalen Unternehmentums äh, bieten sich viele Optionen für Entwicklungsländer, sowohl auf der lokalen als auch auf den internationalen Märkten und der Rahmen von IKT-basierten Dienstleistungen. Mit der Schaffung geeigneter Rahmenbedingungen und gezielten Fördermaßnahmen kann so die Digitalisierung ganz sicher eine wichtige Rolle bei der Beschäftigungsförderung in unseren Partnerländern spielen. Auf der anderen Seite bringen diese Entwicklungen aber auch bestimmte Herausforderungen mit sich. Die GEZ unterstützt seit 2017 das Fair Work Foundation, die sich für Transparenz und faire Arbeit in der Ökonomie einsetzt. Sie hat gemeinsam mit der ILO fünf Kriterien faire Arbeit entwickelt, die als Grundlage für die Bewertung von Arbeitsbedingungen auf digitalen Plattformen dienen. Und das will ich am Ende einfach nochmal unterstreichen. Diese sind faire Bezahlung, faire Verträge, faire Bedingungen, faire Managementprozesse und faire Mitbestimmung. Und da will ich einfach einen Punkt machen. Thank you so much, sir. I haven't been able to get the uh, translation on, but I'm sure our organizers, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, so, so I'm, but I'm sure the organizers will put out the uh, translation of your intervention um, somehow digitally. But uh, thank you so much. And I'm really sorry about the very limited time you've had. You tried very, very much to join us. Um, I'm afraid, I'm afraid I really have to leave it there. Um, this is the thing with this digital forum, right? You're not like when you have a physical gathering, you can just uh, go on a little bit. That's the reality. We all have to adapt. But I'm sure we all walk away with uh, many new ideas and inspirations. So a warm round of applause, whoever you are, wherever you can, to all our panelists. And uh, indeed, I have learned a great deal. And uh, thank you so much for the opportunity to host this panel as well. I hope we do have this discussion in the near future. Thank you very much. It's bye bye from Beijing. Thank you. Bye bye. Thank you. Thank you, <laughs> thank you very much. Thank Bye. you. Thank you. I'm sorry about the time. Yeah.